We talked about skeletal muscle in the sense of the structure, the growth structure of the whole organ, tendons, the connective tissue. We talked about the microanatomy, the myofibrils, the thick myosin and the thin actin. And we went through contraction last time. Remember the, the dirty dozen steps. And, and you can define contraction in, in less steps than that. But again, the students like to call it that. Well, now we're going to look at where does the fuel come from that we use to produce our ATP to supply the S1 domain so that we can continue to contract our muscle. And when we look at the fuel, we're going to see there's really four sources. There are two types. We have the serum glucose and the serum fatty acids, but then we also have that which is trapped in the muscle, the muscle triglyceride, which is the storage form of the fatty acids, and then the muscle glycogen, which we said last time was the storage form of glucose. So as we look at how your body utilizes these raw materials to, again, produce energy, what we're going to see as displayed in this graph, we see that when you begin exercising, and we're going to start with the top here, and this is sort of a mild exercise, and we're going to work out for maybe 30 minutes. So as you begin either mild, moderate, or heavy exercise, you're first going to deplete the glucose that's in your plasma. Now, with increasing intensity, we're going to see that once you burn through your plasma glucose, now we're going to burn through our plasma fatty acids. That's represented in the yellow. Then as we gain in intensity, proceed through the time of our 30 minutes, once we burn through our plasma resources, then we're going to dip into our muscle triglycerides. Now, mild exercise, that's, that's warming up. That's kind of jogging. Moderate exercise, that's where you're working pretty hard. You're on the treadmill, you're on the bike, and you're going, but you probably couldn't go any faster to keep up the pace. When you get to the heavy exercise, this is almost like sprinting, and you see you burn through the plasma sources, your muscle triglycerides, and then you're burning your muscle glycogen. And in fact, this heavy exercise, it's so intense that when we look in the chart below, this is 90 to 120 minutes of exercise. You could not keep up that pace for two hours. And so when you look at level of intensity, if you're wanting to decrease the percentage of your body fat, number one, and this is from a nutritional sense. Do we have any food nutrition folks? Okay. We usually have some in here, but we also usually have more students. But food nutrition-wise, if you want to lose fat, you burn more calories than you consume. That, in a nutshell, is the way you do it. And that's pretty much regardless of what you eat. Now, you can, in fact, go out and just eat junk food. And as long as you burn more calories than you consume, you'll lose weight. But you're not necessarily going to be healthy if you do that. So you've seen people in the gym that get on the treadmill, and they go like gangbusters for 10 minutes just as fast as they can go, and then they're done. They're wiping off, and they're walking away drinking their water. Well, guess what? They're, they're not really going to do a whole lot of good. Because if you want to burn the triglyceride, if you want to burn the fat, you can do mild exercise or even slightly moderate exercise, and that's what's going to get rid of the yellow and the green. Only when you're getting heavy, heavy stuff, that's where you're burning into that muscle glycogen. Now, marathon runners... <clears throat> pardon me, that run for long periods of time, a lot of our track athletes, they will carb load, have you ever heard that term before? The night before. When they say carb load, in fact, on our graph, what are, where are they placing the carbs? Are they placing them in the plasma glucose fraction? No, they're giving your body time to store it in the muscle as glycogen because they're going to need that toward the end of their run or if they have to sprint to the finish line. That's the fuel they're going to be burning. 
Now, this gets a little bit more at exercise intensity and what you're burning. Here, again, if we're talking moderate exercise, 60% of your maximal heart rate, and you can uh, deduce what your maximal heart rate is. I think it's 220 minus your age. That gives you a guesstimate of your maximal heart rate. But if we can find age here, y'all are probably in the neighborhood of 20-ish. So we're talking 120 beats a minute. That, that's not really, really heavy, heavy type work. But you're in your fitness fat burning mode. That's really all you have to do. But if you're getting up here 80% of your maximal heart rate, 160 beats a minute, you're in anaerobic now. Now you're producing a lot of lactic acid. You're burning fuel faster than you can bring in oxygen, and you're not going to do that for a long period of time. This is just kind of showing, again, the calories that you burn, and this really is an ex sort of uh, example of time period. You spend more time in these lower-intensity zones, and when you get into these major zones, whoop, that's when, yeah, you're, you're not going to be going as fast. So what's the take-home message? You want to burn fat, stick with the lower intensity because as you burn through, first, plasma glucose, plasma fatty acids. I think I got that wrong. Um, your plasma sources, then you're going to get into your muscle triglyceride and last muscle glucose. So you don't have to burn so fast for a short period of time. Just be consistent, moderate exercise. So when we look at our two types of exercise, just from a sense of relating to endurance and oxygen, anaerobic exercise, this is where you're going so hard, so fast, you can't do it for long periods of time. So short duration, heavy intensity, we're talking about bodybuilders, weightlifting, sprinters. Because again, Usain Bolt can't run a marathon at the speed that he runs 100 meters. Because he's pretty impressive whenever you see how fast the like world class marathon runners, like their mile split times. Oh, I know. Like four and a half minutes. Oh, yeah. Like I think it's like between four fifteen and four and a half. Yeah, I'm yeah, like I said, I'm not running. No. <laughs> Call nine one one if you see me running. But then we get to the aerobic exercise. This is the endurance sports, walking, running, cycling. I mean, in the Tour de France, they go for about 30 days or so run, riding about 100 kilometers a day. And when you look at the elevation that they're riding, they're, they're not sprinting the entire time. And, of course, on a bicycle, you can kind of take it easy coming down the hills. But if you see them, they're continuously eating and drinking. They're continuously filling their plasma with glucose. And, in fact, a lot of these riders have these packs. It's almost like honey. It's just pure gelatinous sugar, and they're keeping that in their body, supplying the fuel, and as long as their heart and their respiratory system can keep up the oxygen demand, they will never go into anaerobic, and that's what enables them to ride for such long periods of time. Now, we're going to get to the lactic acid system as far as anaerobic, but we're going to start with one that you may not be familiar with. And this is the creatine phosphate or the phosphocreatine pathway. A lot of power lifters and bodybuilders, they will use supplements. In addition to the protein, they will use creatine phosphate or creatine. And this is a protein that is stored in muscle. And what creatine, in fact, does in the muscle, it acts like your ATM card. We've all probably used and experienced our ATM card. When you first get your ATM card in the mail, if you have not set up and filled your bank account with money, is that card going to be any use to you whatsoever? No, you've got to have money in the bank before that card's going to be used to you. Creatine in your muscles will do absolutely nothing. You have to supply it with currency. And the currency for creatine is the same currency that is used on ADP. Are you going to get any work done if you have ADP in your body? No. You have to charge it first. You have to load the currency, which is the third phosphate. Creatine has to be loaded with a phosphate. And the energy of the bond between the phosphate and the creatine 
is relatively the same energy of the bond between the third and the second phosphate of ATP. So how this works is when there's abundance of ATP in the muscle, when you're at rest, some of that energy of the, the bond between the second and third phosphate is going to be released. And you're going to take creatine and you're going to load it with that energy and add the phosphate. And that's going to be the storage form of additional energy. That then frees up the ADP to go out and become ATP. Do you see how it's working as an energy buffer? So that when your energy is in short supply, now ADP is abundant, and you look at the stoichiometry and the directionality of certain chemical reactions, when ADP is in abundance, what it's going to do is it's going to drive the, the reaction in the reverse. It will take creatine phosphate, remove the phosphate, recover the energy, and produce ATP. Do you see how that's sort of a backup system? That's not going to carry you forever, and it's not going to carry you for very long, but it is in some way a little energy reserve above and beyond what we have with just simply ATP. Now, the lactic acid pathway. Basically, when we're running short of oxygen, we go through this process of fermentation, if we can loosely refer to it in that, that manner. We're going to use glycolysis, but we're going to stop at pyruvate. Pyruvate, however, becomes toxic as it builds up in your body, so we have to remove the pyruvate also to keep glycolysis moving. So instead of plugging pyruvate into the Krebs cycle, pyruvate is going to be worked on and broken down into lactic acid. So you're going to recover a very minuscule amount of energy that's stored in glucose, but again, a little is better than none. And when you go into your anaerobic glycolysis, again, when you're doing highly intense exercises, about two minutes is all you're going to be able to do, and your effectiveness is going to plummet until you completely fatigue, and the training then is over. So here we have the beginnings of our metabolism of glucose going to glycolysis. There's our two ATP. We come out with pyruvate. However, pyruvate is going to be broken down into lactate, lactic acid. So it's going to be those two ATP. That is the real principal aspect of running through this fermentation process and animal cells in the production of lactate. Not that we want to use lactate for anything. It simply is removing the pyruvate from the system so we can make two more ATP from glucose. But the lactic acid is that thing that we don't like. It builds up in our serum. It builds up in our muscles. It's, it's what makes us sore, and it decreases the effectiveness of the muscle. And so when we look at fitness and a measure of an athlete's performance and their ability to perform, what their potential. We're also going to look at a measure that is called VO2 max. What is the maximum amount of oxygen that can be utilized by this particular athlete before they may move into anaerobic respiration? Now, what we're going to see with most athletes is there's going to be a direct relationship between intensity of the air exercise and the consumption of oxygen. That makes sense. Until we get to a plateau, then it's like, okay, we're done. And that plateau is going to represent your VO2 max, and then fatigue is going to hit, and you're going to stop exercising. You can't get there. And in fact, I don't know if I have ever achieved my VO2 max, because it says it is a painful point. I, I don't think I've ever done any kind of exercise to the point that I was working so hard it got painful and I had to stop. Now, when it approaches getting painful, I stop, in, I, I stop way early. I am, I am never going to achieve this. And in fact, I find it interesting. Uh, who's the owner of the Atlanta Hawks? Jesse... I can't... It starts with the I. His last name starts with the I. He just wrote a book not that long ago 
uh, my life with a seal. He met this Navy SEAL. Um, and, and again, I beg your pardon, I can't remember the SEAL's name. But it was in an endurance race, one of these extreme endurance 100-mile races. And this Atlanta Hawks owner was in a team of six people that were basically doing a relay. They each had a portion of this 100-mile race. Well, this Navy SEAL was running it by itself. They had tents. They had food. They had medics. They said this guy had a lounge chair, a bottle of water, and a bag of crackers. Only one bottle of water and a bag of crackers? That's what, that's what he said. I, I've, there's some YouTube videos on this. The, the Navy SEAL at mile 70 had broken every bone in his foot, and his kidneys were starting to shut down. But he finished the 100-mile race. And so he invited this guy to come live with him, and the first thing he had him do is say, okay, do, do as many pull-ups as you can. And he said, okay, he did 10. He said, okay, do it again. After 30 seconds, and he did like seven. He said, okay, 30 seconds and do it again. And he did three. He said, okay, do it again. And the guy's like, I, I can't. I can't do it again. The seal said, we're going to stay here until you do 100. And so he would rest, do a couple, rest, do it. But he did 100 of them. And the seal said, that's an example of what we as in the teams call the 40% rule. When your brain tells you you're done, your body is really only 40% done. So I stopped way before 40%, and that's way before VO2 max. So that's a long story to kind of get at the point that we really are never going to achieve that because our body has such a greater capacity to do work. And think of it like an energy reserve that we never tap into. Now, if you're running for your life, yeah, you're, you're going to surpass the 40 because you have a whole different motivation than just recreational cycling or, or running. This is an interesting chart. It shows some of the uh, VO2 maxes for athletes at different ages, males versus females. And generally speaking, as you look at these ranges, you're going to see, for instance, there is some overlap of many of these. <clears throat> but we're going to see like in, um, where's a good one here? Um, look at swimming. VO2 max for males is 50 to 70. When we look in females, it's 40 to 60. And in almost every aspect, even though there's some overlap, the VO2 max for males is generally going to be at the higher end of the range. Now, that's not any sort of bias or bigotry. Why do you think physiologically and biologically males have higher VO2 max than females? We've been talking about oxygen supplying to what tissue? Muscle. So when you look at males versus females, typically and just very broadly speaking, males have greater muscle mass than females in the normal population. Don't put me up against either Venus or Serena because I'm sure they got way more muscle than I got. So world-class athletes, that's a whole different ball game. But generally speaking, muscle mass is going to be greater in males and females, and it's going to require a greater VO2 max. Here's another way to look at VO2 max. Again, with age, your VO2 max is going to start to decrease. You know, the average is going to be in these areas where we have just sort of these um, arbitrary numbers. And some athletes, this was a cyclist where I found this. He, he was a world-class cyclist, and he was way here. I'm sure I'm way down in this below average range. I don't like cardio stuff. I don't like it all. I weight lift, and that's about it. And they make fun of me all the time because if I start sweating, I take a break because I'm working too hard. So VO2 max is an interesting measure, but it's very challenging to measure. Another way you can get a measure of fitness is looking at the lactate threshold. At what point do you begin to see lactic acid produced and moving into the bloodstream? And so if we look at VO2 max for our two different athletes here, so we look at intensity and we got that measured by running speed, 
we can see that the VO2 max is fairly close together. So these two athletes, it, it might be difficult to say, okay, which of these two athletes is the most fit? And that may not even be a statistical difference. But when you look at their lactate threshold in the blue, we're going to see athlete one, you start to see lactic acid at about 60% of their VO2 max. And this athlete, you're going to see lactate at 70% of VO2 max. A bigger difference. Here we have it illustrated again, running speed for these two, this, this particular athlete in general. And while we're not going to do a whole lot for our VO2 max, we can see that this athlete before training, the lactate threshold is about 10 kilometers per hour when you start to see lactic acid going in. But with training, you can see we've moved that threshold out to 11.8. So lactic, lactate threshold is going to be a very good marker of your fitness level. And you can increase your body's capacity to consume and produce and supply oxygen to your tissues with training and intensity. You're, cre you're increasing that cardiovascular fitness. Speaking of cardiovascular fitness, now we're going to shift and look at the other two types of muscle. And the first we're going to look at is cardiac muscle. Now again, on exam one, no surprise, you got some compare contrast questions, right? Told you they were coming. There's going to be more. And so when we look at cardiac muscle versus skeletal muscle, we're going to see that they both contract. They both contain actin and myosin. If you don't have actin and myosin, you're not going to contract. Skeletal muscle attached to bones. Cardiac muscle is only found in the heart, and you may find some cardiac muscle in the, the closest part of your pulmonary veins. Skeletal muscle, long cables. Cardiac muscle, branched cables. They're branched and woven together in what are referred to as lamina, and these lamina are like sheets. And these sheets are going to help us form the three-dimensional structure of the heart. Now notice, cardiac muscle is also striated. Now what conferred a striated pattern of skeletal muscle? What's that repeating unit? Sarcomeres. So we have that same sarcomeric arrangement in cardiac muscle as we do in skeletal muscle. Now we're going to look at some pictures because it's not exactly the same, but that difference we're not going to worry about here. We'll talk about that difference if you take my histology class, if I ever get to teach it again. Hopefully it'll make next fall since we're not doing it this fall. So like skeletal muscle, we have a striated pattern. Unlike skeletal muscle, however, cardiac muscle is involuntary. You cannot, by sheer will, cause your heart to beat faster or slower. You can do things to cause your heart to slow down. You can lay down. You can relax. Or you can run up a flight of stairs or do some push-ups and your heart will go faster. So that's, that's the difference. Voluntary for skeletal, involuntary for cardiac. Now, that being said, do you have any skeletal muscles in your body that are involuntary? It's kind of a trick question. How about this? Do you have any voluntary skeletal muscles that you can subconsciously control? That's a better way to ask that question. And the answer is yes. In fact... Every single one of you right now have, have a couple of sets of skeletal muscle that you're using, but you're not sitting there consciously saying, do this, do this, do this. What's one of those things? Breathing. Breathing. Posture is, is kind of one, but there's another one that's a little bit more obvious. Blinking. Blinking. You don't sit there and go blink, blink. Now, this is usually where I insert a blonde joke, but since we're such a small class, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Blinking. 
But you can control blinking, right? You can just close your eyes and keep them closed. You can will them to stay closed. I'm not blinking now. Or you, have you ever played the game, don't blink? Game with your siblings, right? Breathing is another. Your diaphragm is skeletal muscle. You're not going to breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. You can hold your breath. Unlike skeletal muscle, which contracts when you signal it to contract with an action potential. Cardiac muscle cells are going to have an inherent rhythmicity. They have a rhythm to them. And they contract spontaneously. You can remove a heart from an organism. And you can watch it beating sitting in a dish for a limited amount of time. You need no nervous system input from the central nervous system for your heart to beat. It does it before you're born, and it's going to do it until you die by itself. We're going to see nervous system input can cause your heart to beat faster or beat slower, but it doesn't instruct it to beat. That's built in. It's intrinsic. So some cellular characteristics. We've got our long cables of branching cardiac muscle cells. Cardiac muscle cells have one nucleus per cell. Skeletal muscle had quite a few. They were multinucleated. We're going to see that instead of these long cables, continuous cables of skeletal muscle, our individual cardiac muscle cells are joined together with these really tight junction that allows some communication that we call intercalated discs. We're going to look at them more closely in just a second. Cardiac muscle cells are also chock full of mitochondria. In fact, 50% of the volume of cardiac muscle cells is mitochondria, as well as loaded down with myoglobin. So when you see myoglobin, and you see so many mitochondria, you should already be thinking cardiac muscle cells really like to function under what sort of contracting conditions, aerobic or anaerobic? Aerobic. In fact, if you deprive the heart of oxygen, cardiac muscle cells do not necessarily go into fermentation and lactic acid pathway. Cardiac muscle cells die. And when cardiac muscle cells die, what, what do we call that clinically? Heart attack or myocardial infarct. The cells just die. So do not deprive those cells of oxygen. Now, in this slide, we see an electron microscopic view, longitudinal view of cardiac muscle. We see these light bands. What do you think we call those light bands? I bands. The dark line right down the middle, Z line. What about this dark one? A band, light in the middle. H and dark right there, M. Same batting pattern, same sarcomeric pattern. But I told you it was a little different than skeletal muscle. When you look across skeletal muscle, all of the Z lines are lined up perfect, but you see how these are sort of staggered? That's one way you can identify and distinguish cardiac and skeletal muscle. I'm never going to have you do that in here. Again, that's for histology, sort of that advanced class. But our sarcomere goes from Z line to Z line, right? So there's a Z line, there's a Z line, there's a what in the world? This extreme, massive, fuzzy, zigzaggy Z line, that is an intercalated disc. So we have joined this cardiac muscle cell with this cardiac muscle cell, and that's going to happen in what should be a Z line. But when it's expanded like this, it's an intercalated disc, and you automatically know, okay, this is cardiac muscle. You, you got a hint because of the staggered sarcomeres now with the Z disc. You know that's what you're looking at. And the Z disc is going to serve two major functions, strength and connection, joining the two cells together, but it's also going to allow electrical communication. So when we look at what we call the transverse portion, if you think of the intercalated disc like a stair, uh, set of stairs, like we have here, you've got the part of the stair that comes up, which is called the rise. That's going to be our transverse portion. And then we have the part you step on, 
which is called the run, and that's going to be the lateral portion. So let's look at first at the transverse. This is where we have proteins that form these junctional complexes called the fascia adherens and other junctions called desmosomes. They have intra uh, membrane proteins that extend and connect to the cytoplasm but also extend outside the cell into the extracellular space. And these two different cell membrane proteins on opposing cells link together like Velcro. They're very, very strong and so as the cells contract and they're pulling in this direction, it's going to prevent the cells from pulling apart. So that's the function of the junctions. Now, when we look at the lateral portion, the run, this is going to be 90 degrees. It's perpendicular to the stress of the contraction, so there's not a lot of shear force that's happening on this lateral portion. And what we see in this part of the membrane is we see some junctional complexes called gap junctions. Do you remember those from intro cell biology? Tunnels in the membrane that causes the cytoplasm of one cell to be continuous with the cytoplasm of the next. Why do you think this is going to be important in muscle cells that are instructed to contract? First of all, let's think back. Our skeletal muscle cells contracted because of the action potential. Opening and closing of sodium, potassium channels that sent the signal. When we open a sodium voltage gated channel and sodium goes in which direction? In. Where does the sodium go? Everywhere. It comes in and goes everywhere. That distance was about two, um, yeah, one to two millimeter. Very fast moving, widespread. So if we have these two cells, and in this cell on the right, it undergoes an action potential. Sodium comes in, gives us an EPSP up to minus 55 millivolts. The sodium is going to go everywhere, right? But part of that sodium is going to flow through the gap junctions and go into the neighboring cell that is closer than 1 to 2 millimeters. What's going to happen to the membrane potential in the neighboring cell? It's going to reach thresholds. Sodium voltage gated channels are going to open. It's going to depolarize. You get action potential. So our gap junctions are going to electrically and functionally connect all of the cardiac muscle cells. So when one cell depolarizes, they all depolarize. And since you have a lot of individual cells working together as one functional unit, we say that the gap junctions allow the cardiac tissue to work as a functional syncytium. A syncytium is one unit comprised of many working parts. And that's one way in which the cardiac muscle can have a rhythm and contract spontaneously. So in this very simple illustration, we've got our sarcomeres. You can see our mitochondria illustrated. Here's our intercalated disc, again, where we see the fuzzy um, markings. That's going to be our adhesive junctions in the transverse portion. And here where we see this thinner part, that's going to be our gap junction in the lateral portion. And again, the cells are going to be contracting and pulling from right to left. Just another electron microscopic view. Again, you can see how the sarcomeres aren't lining up. You can identify the Z lines. And we see all of these very elongated, very large mitochondria. So it's very easy to identify this histologically as cardiac muscle. Third type of muscle. The first two types we called striated because they had stripes. The third type of muscle we call smooth because guess what? It doesn't have stripes, no striations. Now listen very carefully because this often trips up some people that are just getting introduced to muscles, 
microanatomy. What causes the striped pattern in our sarcomeres? What causes that banding pattern to be visible? What two proteins? What did you just say? You said myosin and actin. How are you supposed to say that? Thick myosin and thin actin. I'm giving you a hard time. Now, a lot of people will say thick myosin, thin actin equals sarcomeres, striations. And if we don't have striations, then we don't have thick actin and thin myosin. Oh, I said that backwards. Thick myosin and thin actin. You did that to me. That's not true. We still have the thick myosin and the thin actin. It simply is arranged differently so that it doesn't confer this overall striated pattern to the cell. We're going to see there's still overlapping filaments. There's still sliding of the actin over the myosin. That's, that's how it's going to contract. But we simply don't have it arranged into sarcomeres. Is that we kind of understand? We'll see a little picture and explain a little more later. So we have no striations. We have no T-tubules. There are also T-tubules, sarcoplasmic reticula in cardiac muscle. So a lot of those microscopic elements are still present in both skeletal and cardiac. We don't have them in our smooth muscle. No T tubules, no sarcoplasmic reticulum. So you can already tell things are going to be slightly different. Now, like cardiac muscle, smooth muscle is involuntary. Smooth muscle around the bronchioles of your airway, smooth muscles around your gastrointestinal tract, around your blood vessels. You can't control those. They are under autonomic control. We do have uh, typically a single nucleus in our, our smooth muscle, like single nucleus in cardiac. Again, you can see the compare and the contrast we can do with these. And we will have our myofilaments, our actin and our myosin. But these are connected not in a Z-disc, so to speak, but they're connected into the plasma membrane in areas that are called dense bodies. And dense bodies are going to have structural proteins, including alpha-actinin. Remember, we had that in the Z-line? So our dense bodies, I want you to think of them in much the same way as we did the Z-line. Now, Z-line to Z-line, we use that to define a sarcomere. In smooth muscle, our contractal distance is going to be dense body to dense body. That's where we're pulling. So we're pulling one part of a plasma membrane and the other part of a plasma membrane closer together. And so while our cardiac muscle cell is said to be fusiform or spindle shape, it's going to be tapered on the ends and rounded in the middle, what we're going to do when we contract, we're going to convert that elongated like cell into more of what looks like a ball. We're just going to cause it to collapse down on itself in three dimensions. So in this illustration, you can see the little oval structures. Those are our dense bodies, a.k.a. Z-discs. We've got our thick green, and since we're thick, what do we know that is? Thick myosin and the purple thin filaments. Those are our thin actin. And so you see... Dense body to dense body, that's going to be similar to what we call a sarcomere in our cardiac and skeletal muscle. But in this case, do you see how they're going in all different directions? So that when we have just this one sarcomeric type arrangement in one plane in one direction, it's, there's not going to be enough there for us to visualize with a microscope. And so that's why we don't see the striped pattern even though we do have our actin and our myosin present attached to the dense bodies. So in addition to no T-tubules, in addition to no sarcoplasmic reticulum, we don't have any troponin either. But we do have tropomyosin in smooth muscle. It simply isn't playing a role in blocking the binding of myosin to the actin. It's playing more of a structural role. And our myosin 
is arranged a little different, but we still are going to have our, our arm-shaped myosin molecule. We're still going to have our filamentous and globular actin. But in the case of smooth muscle, there's nothing blocking the S1 binding site on globular actin. It's free and available for myosin to bind to it. There's going to be a different way that we prevent that interaction while the smooth muscle is at rest. Now, again, we talked about vimentin and desmin with our skeletal muscle, desmin being characteristic of muscle in general. But what we're going to see is when we throw vimentin into the mix with smooth muscle, we have a setting where we have uh, unitary smooth muscle. And if we have smooth muscle lacking the vimentin, then it's called a multi-unit smooth muscle. We're going to see these at the very end of our discussion of smooth muscle. And it's how some smooth muscle cells can work independent of others, whereas some are tied together with gap junctions like cardiac muscle, and they can work as a functional syncytium as well. No sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? No troponin. So you may think if we don't have the storage compartment for calcium, and if we don't have the molecule that binds calcium, then calcium must not be responsible for the contraction, and that is wrong. Calcium is going to play a very important role in smooth muscle contraction. And so I, I, I kind of think of this like evolution at some point decided, you know what, instead of having this big, huge sarcoplasmic reticulum, let's just break it up into little spheres, little membrane-bound compartments of calcium that can release it and can pump it back in. And then let's stick all these sarcoplasmic reticular spheres to the underside of the plasma membrane. Except we don't call that sarcoplasmic reticulum. We call them caviole, sarcolimal vesicles. And again, they're just hanging on the cytoplasmic surface of the plasma membrane all over the smooth muscle cell, and they function in calcium storage, release, and pumping it back in, just like the function of our sarcoplasmic reticulum in skeletal and cardiac muscle. So if we look, if we were inside a smooth muscle cell looking up at the plasma membrane, the inside part, here are all these little spheres, all of these little sarcolimal vesicles. This is where all the calcium is stored. And so there's very little calcium, if any, inside the muscle cell until an action potential hits, activates the voltage-gated calcium release channels, and calcium floods into the cytoplasm. That sounds similar to what we did with cardiac and how it's going to work with smooth. Cardiac muscle contraction is the same as skeletal muscle contraction. You don't have to learn a difference in the contraction of those. But we are going to have to learn how this differs in our smooth muscle. And one big difference is what keeps myosin from interacting with the actin when the muscle is relaxed. In skeletal and cardiac, it was the tropomyosin was blocking the site on actin. In smooth muscle, the reason the S1 domain of myosin does not interact with actin, even though it was exposed, is because the S1 domain when the muscle is relaxed, is bound to its own myosin tail. So it's bound to the light chain. It, fold, it folds up like this. See me grabbing my shirt here at the shoulder? Since it's bound to the light chain, it can't interact with actin. And what's going to happen, that calcium release is going to lead to a signaling cascade that's going to lead to myosin being unfolded. And when myosin unfolds, it's going to be able to form a cross bridge and do all the contraction. So we have to unfold it. And that regulatory step is going to be due to phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. So when the light chain of miramycin does not have a phosphate, that's when the S1 domain is locked. That's when the muscle is relaxed. So we need to activate an enzyme that will go add a phosphate to 
the myosin light chain. And that's where calcium is going to come in. Here you can see our myosin in this illustration is bound back to itself. This is relaxed. Then when it gets a signal, it, it unfolds and boom, forms a cross bridge and can start the whole contractile process until we turn it back off by removing that phosphate. Now, if you downloaded the guide at the, be at the beginning of the semester, I, I put this new guide up last week. So hopefully you have this. It's basically walking through the entire contractile process, just like we did with skeletal muscle, showing you the differences. This particular slide is going to almost be identical. We've got the neurotransmitter released, not necessarily acetylcholine. We may use norepinephrine with these as well. So whatever the neurotransmitter is, it's going to bind to its receptor. Since we're talking about smooth muscle, it's either going to lead to an EP or an IPSP, depending on the neurotransmitter and depending on the smooth muscle we're using. That's going to lead to our changes. And if we hit minus 55, then we're going to get an action potential in our smooth muscle. So do you see how that's basically the same? It's what we've done before, right? Not a whole lot of difference except for the EP and the IPs. Now, once the action potential hits the smooth muscle cell, we're going to open calcium release channels in the caviole, not the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium is going to be released and it's going to flood into the area where we have our myosin and actin. But rather than bind to troponin, in smooth muscle, that released calcium is going to bind to our old friend that we saw at the end of our axon terminus. Do you remember calcium came flooding into the end of our axon? We're going to use that to signal the release of neurotransmitters. What did calcium bind to in the end of our axon? Calmodulin, same thing. Here in smooth muscle, Calcium that floods into the cytoplasm from our caviole binds to and activates calmodulin. Calmodulin is an activated second messenger. Now we'll turn on myosin light chain kinase. A kinase is an enzyme that adds a phosphate. And usually the first part of that name tells you what's being phosphorylated. So myosin light chain kinase is the enzyme that adds a phosphate to the myosin light chain. And that phosphorylation event leads to the unfolding of the myosin molecule. Does everyone follow that so far? So that is kind of different than we saw with skeletal muscle. But now we get into the steps where, okay, we've unfolded myosin. Well, guess what? S1 domain is already loaded with ATP, broken down to ADP and phosphate. Tropomyosin is not in the way, so it binds to the S1 binding site on globular actin. We form a cross bridge. What happens after you form a cross bridge? What, what's that? The phosphate gets ejected, which leads to the power stroke. After we have a power stroke, and we're going to have several synchronous power strokes, like the pistons on your car, we have to release the ADP, get a new molecule of ATP to reset. As long as calcium is present, we're going to continue contracting. When the action potential stops, calcium is going to get pumped back into the caviole. See how it sounds very similar, yet just subtle differences? Smooth and skeletal slash cardiac muscle contraction. When the action potential stops, calcium gets sucked back in. Calmodulin's no longer activated myosin light chain kinase. But the phosphate doesn't just automatically come off. 
when these events happen, a second enzyme, myosin light chain phosphatase, completely different enzyme, it's activated and it goes and pulls the phosphate off the myosin light chain. So in the very last contracture relaxation event, instead of binding back to actin, the S1 domain binds back to its own light chain and now the smooth muscle relaxes. In our illustration here, we've got calcium coming in. We've got calcium binding to calmodulin, activates. There's myosin light chain kinase, adds a phosphate to the S1 domain, leads to the unfolding. We get our contractile events. Once we need to relax, the action potential stops. Myosin light chain phosphatase dephosphorylates pulls the phosphate off, and the smooth muscle relaxes. This is another illustration just showing the same thing, showing our depolarization events, and smooth muscle can be graded like we see with any of our other muscle types. And this just shows myosin light chain phosphatase, myosin light chain kinase, and how they play in either the cross bridge formation or cross bridge separation and relaxation. Just a different way to look at it. Now here's our example in our discussion of multi-unit versus unitary smooth muscle. So multi-unit is where each cell can contract independently. These are in very, very small muscle organs. The ciliary muscle that's in your eye to, to pull on the lens to adjust your focal accommodation but it's also in erector pili muscles. And where do we find erector pili muscles? It's in your skin attached to your hair. That's what causes goosebumps. Very, very small. But in our unitary type, this is where the smooth muscles are functionally connected via gap junctions, like our cardiac muscle. And when one depolarizes, they all depolarize. And so this is going to be an example like the large muscles that surround your intestines the smooth muscle layers of your stomach where you need a lot of strength, you need a lot of movement, and so they're all going to be connected together. And what's interesting for both of these types, our axons don't simply send the axon down and have a single terminus. These can actually secrete neurotransmitters along the length of the axon in, in sort of swollen areas that are called... Um, Varicosities, and these varicosities along the way can release neurotransmitters as the action potential is passing by or passing through. And so this is referred to as synapsis in passant. So here you can see the varicosities along an axon. You can see the gap junctions interconnecting these cells. And then our multi-unit type, we can see we still have varicosities, we still have secretions, but each cell is independent of the other because there are no gap junctions. And so this is how smooth muscle works in your body. This is how we can use actin and myosin to do very different things depending on if we're arranged in skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, or smooth muscle.